Hi, this is Dennis O'Hare, the narrator for Willpower by Roy Baumeister and John Tierney. As an actor, we have many, many tools, and of course we use our faces, our hands, our voices, our inflections to get across our ideas. But when you're doing an audiobook, obviously we lose some of our tools. We lose some of our preferred methods of communicating. So it's kind of hard when you only have your voice, when you only have inflection and timbre and uh, accents to get your point across. So doing audiobooks is a great sort of acting lesson. You have to figure out by using rhythm and pace and emphasis and color how you're going to get across these ideas. And especially in a book with characters where you have to actually give a flavor of the character. It can make it a real challenge. It's exciting. I actually really enjoy it. It brings me back to basic acting questions. It definitely is a, uh, a different process than acting in front of a camera. I've done several audiobooks, and they've all been a little bit different. Usually I do fiction, and I've done some uh, children's fiction or, I guess, teen fiction. I've also done some pot boilers, you know, mystery-type things. Those books are difficult because you have to go through the entire book and find all the characters and make character notes and figure out, if I have 130 characters, how am I going to differentiate them, finding the voices, finding the rhythms. You also have characters that may age in a book, so you have to figure out how you're going to handle that. And also, as a man, doing female characters versus male characters is always a consideration. Doing this book, Willpower, this is actually my first nonfiction book, and I thought, oh, how easy, no characters. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> there are lots of characters. I was shocked when I went through the book to begin preparing that there were characters. I have to do the voices for a lot of the people who are quoted. I struggled with it and thought, well, maybe I won't do a voice. But then if you're reading the book, you will naturally provide a voice if you're given a quotation from a character. So I decided to go ahead and do it. And some of the characters are quite famous people, so I hope I haven't gotten uh, in trouble. One of my day jobs, or my night jobs, is playing a vampire uh, for HBO and True Blood. You may think that a vampire has nothing to do with the idea of willpower, but really, my character had been alive 2,800 years, and that takes a supreme act of will, or willpower. You have to stay out of the sun if you're a vampire, otherwise you'll die. You have to make sure you don't drain your bodies, or you'll kill them if you want to keep them alive. And you have to make sure that you um, don't get staked. So I feel like I was particularly well-suited to go ahead and do a book on willpower. Hi, this is Dennis O'Hare, the narrator for Willpower by Roy Baumeister and John Tierney. Here's an excerpt I hope you'll enjoy. Is willpower more than the metaphor? Sometimes we are devils to ourselves, when we will tempt the frailty of our powers, presuming on their changeful potency. Troilus in Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida. If you have a casual acquaintance with Amanda Palmer's music, if you know about her Band in Britain abortion song, or the backstabber video of her running down a hall naked holding an upraised knife while chasing the equally naked guy in lipstick who was just in bed with her, you probably don't think of her as a paragon of self-control. She has been described in a lot of ways. An edgier Lady Gaga, a funnier Madonna, a gender-bending provocateur, the high priestess of Brechtian punk cabaret. But the words Victorian and repressed generally don't come up. Her persona is Dionysian. When she accepted a marriage proposal from Neil Gaiman, the British fantasy novelist, Palmer's idea of a formal announcement was a morning after confession on Twitter that she might have gotten engaged but also might have been drunk. Yet an undisciplined artist could never have written so much music or sold out so many concerts around the world. Palmer couldn't have gotten to Radio City Music Hall without practicing. It took self-control to create her uncontrolled persona, and she credits her success partly to what she calls the ultimate Zen training ground, posing as a living statue. She performed in the streets for six years, and started a company hiring out living statues for corporate gigs, like holding platters of organic produce at the opening of a Whole Foods supermarket. Palmer took up this calling in 1998, when she was 22 and living in her hometown, Boston. She made videos describing herself as 
an aspiring rock star. But that occupation didn't pay the rent, so she went into Harvard Square and introduced a form of street theater she'd seen in Germany. She called herself the Eight-Foot Bride. With her face painted white, wearing a formal wedding dress and a veil, holding a bouquet in her formal white gloves, she would stand on top of a box. If someone put money in her tips basket, she would hand the person a flower. But otherwise, she remained utterly motionless. Some people would insult her or throw things at her. They tried to make her laugh. They grabbed her. Some yelled at her to get a real job and threatened to steal her money. Drunks tried to pull her down off the pedestal or to tip her over. It was not pretty, Palmer recalls. Once I had a frat boy rub his head drunkenly in my crotch as I looked skyward thinking, good Lord, what have I done to deserve this? But in six years, I broke character maybe twice. You literally don't react. You don't even flinch. You just let it pass through you. The crowds would marvel at her stamina, and people routinely assumed it must be grueling to hold the body in a rigid pose for so long. But Palmer didn't find it a strain on her muscles. She realized there was a physical aspect to the task. She learned not to drink coffee, for instance, because it produced a slight but uncontrollable quiver in her body. But the challenge seemed to be mainly in her mind. Standing still isn't really that difficult, she says. The discipline in being a living statue was much more in the non-reactivity department. I couldn't move my eyes, so I couldn't look at interesting, intriguing things that were passing me by. I couldn't engage with people who were trying to engage me. I couldn't laugh. I couldn't wipe my nose if a piece of snot started to dribble down my upper lip. I couldn't scratch my ear if I had an itch. If a mosquito landed on my cheek, I couldn't swat at it. Those were the real challenges. But even though the challenge was mental, she also noticed that it eventually took a physical toll. As much as she liked the money, usually about $50 an hour, she found she couldn't do it for long. She would typically work for 90 minutes, take an hour break, get back on the box for another 90 minutes, then call it a day. Sometimes on a Saturday in peak tourist season, she would supplement her street work by going to a Renaissance festival and posing as a wood nymph for a few hours. But it left her exhausted. I'd get home barely alive, barely able to feel my body, she says. I would put myself into the bathtub and my brain would be completely blank. Why? She hadn't been expending energy to move her muscles. She hadn't been breathing harder. Her heart hadn't been beating faster. What was so hard about doing nothing? She would have said that she'd been exercising willpower to resist temptation, but that folk concept from the 19th century had been mostly abandoned by modern experts. What would it even mean to say that a person was exercising willpower? How could it be shown to be anything more than a metaphor? The answer, as it turned out, was to start with warm cookies.